Okay, so I'm going to be reading Red Kayak Chapter 2. In some ways it started over a year ago, but I want to get the worst over first, so I'm going to start with what happened six months ago in the spring. That morning we were waiting, my two friends and I, for the ambulance to come, and JT took a swig from his bottle of green tea. I remember this because Digger was trying to pick a fight, and it all started with JT's green tea. No one was hurt. That's not why the ambulance was coming. My cousin Carl has this old ambulance that the county still uses for a backup, and when he had the early shift, he would swing by and give us a ride to school. School's only a couple miles away, but it's a 40-minute ride on that dang bus because we're first pickup on the loop. Besides, it was pretty cool getting to ride in the ambulance. JT almost always waits for the bus with me. He lives next door on his family's chicken farm. A soybean field between my house and his has a path worn down through the middle of it that we're back and forth on it so much. And Digger is across the road, not, that, not too far the other way. Sometimes he walks over to join us. That, or his father will drop him off from his uh, dump truck on his way to a job. So we were in the driveway that morning, waiting for Carl to come and pick us up. Backpacks on the ground. Hunched in our parkas because it was chilly. Taking turns throwing the tennis ball for Tilly, who never quits. And Digger snatched the bottle of green tea out of JT's hands and started laughing. What the? Shh. I'm always having to tone Digger down. My mom can hear and she can't stand to hear us cuss. We cast a glance back at the house. Digger held the bottle up out of JT's reach. Green tea with ginseng and honey. He sounded disgusted. It made me uncomfortable the way Digger talked to JT sometimes, and after all those years that we spent growing up together. But JT just laughed. He's pretty easygoing. And he swiped the drink back. Hey, he said, it's, it's loaded with antioxidants. Anti-who? Digger screwed up his face. You wait, Digger, JT warned him. You and Brady, especially Brady because he's always out in the sun. You'll be all old and wrinkly by the time you're 50 and I'll have like, like this perfect skin. <laughs> yeah, like a baby's butt, Digger retorted. Now I wanted to tell him to shut up, but I didn't. I could tell when Digger was in one of his moods. You're just jealous, JT quipped. Of what, Digger demanded. Guys, I called out, stopping everything like a referee's whistle. When they looked at me, I pivoted and flung the ball for Tilly. We watched it land and roll downhill toward our dock. At the same time, my father's bandsaw started up at the old tractor shed, which Dad has transformed into his woodworking shop. Where we used to live, where we live used to be a farm, but it's not anymore. The barn and the farmhouse burned down years ago before my parents bought the property and built a one-story brick rancher. My dad is a waterman half the year, a boat carpenter the other half, and even though crabbing season started April 1st, he's been working Mondays in the shop because he was making more money building cabinets than crabbing, especially now that the crabs were getting scarce. Last year, the state legislature cut dad's work day from 14 hours down to 8. And then the governor took away the month of November, and it hurt us financially. My mom had to put in extra hours at the nursing home, and Dad was pretty tipped off. They're blaming the wrong people, he railed. Pollution and development, that's what's killing us. The baby right smart of crabs if it weren't for all the dang condominiums going up. I don't know. We had a little argument about it after a scientist came to school. He said my dad was only half right about the pollution and all. We're fishing the bay too hard, the guy kept saying. Too many crab pots... Too many trot lines. You gotta take a long look. When Dad's noisy bandsaw stopped, I glanced at JT and Digger and wondered which way the conversation would go. What's your dad working on, JT asked. Dr. Finney's sailboat, I said, glad to move off the subject of JT's green tea. 30-foot sea wind catch. 25 years old. Fiberglass hull, but a lot of solid wood trim topside. JT arched his eyebrows. Wow, he's got his work cut out for him. He's completely gutting it, I said. Dr. Finney's going to put in this incredible electronic system, GPS, flat screen TV, security. I knew this would make JT drool because he loves all that technical stuff. 
but it only made Digger angry. He kicked a rock in the driveway. Yeah, well, some people got too much money for their own dang good. When a pair of noisy mallards flew over, we looked up. Even Tilly dropped the ball and started barking. In the west, I noticed dark clouds piling up along the horizon like a distant mountain range. If the weather didn't look so bad, I'd say come on over this afternoon. We could take a little spin down the river. I felt bad for Digger sometimes on account of his family. Eh, I can't go, he mumbled, still kicking his toe in the dirt. Gotta help my old man haul some gravel. Yeah, me neither, JT said. I erased my entire hard drive last night. I need to load everything back on and rewrite that essay for English. Hey, Brady, remember those oxymorons we talked about in literature the other day? Jumbo shrimp, I asked. Yeah, and military intelligence, JT reminded me. I grinned. Well, I got a good one for you, JT said. Microsoft works. Even Digger lifted his head and chuckled. A perfect idiot, he added. So there we were, all of us laughing because we'd knocked out four oxymorons smack in a row, and that's when we first saw the red kayak. From where we stood, you could see down the grassy slope behind our house, on past Dad's shop and the dock to the creek. And out there, heading our way, was Mr. D'Angelo's new red kayak. Digger's face lit up. The Italian stallion, he chortled, a dual reference to the heritage of our new neighbor, Marcellus D'Angelo, and his obsession with physical fitness. Cupping his hands around his mouth, Digger pretended to call out, Paddle hard, you sucker! He and JT exchanged this look that I didn't quite catch, and JT started laughing too. But I shook my head. You know, he shouldn't be going out there today. When he gets down to the point, he'll fly down the river. Now, I was sure Mr. D'Angelo didn't know about how the wind picked up once you left our creek and hit the open water. Not to mention the spring tides. Sometimes they were so strong they would suck the crab pot buoys under. I, I doubted whether Mr. D'Angelo knew that. He'd only had the kayak a few days. Really, guys, we ought to yell something, I said soberly. JT shook his head. Nah, he's too far away. He won't hear you. Why should we anyway? Digger asked with a scowl. Just because you babysat for his little kid and... You're in love with his wife? That's an overstatement if I ever heard one. Although I, I did take care of their son one afternoon when Mrs. D'Angelo had to go over the bridge to Annapolis for a doctor's appointment. And she is a very good-looking woman, but J, even J.T. and Digger thought so. Ben's cool, I said, trying to make light of it. We, we did Legos. J.T. chuckled and looked at his sneakers. Sneering, Digger stuffed his hands in his pocket. Look, Brady, he said, if he's stupid enough to be out there today, he can take what's coming. Besides, he deserves it. Tilly whined because she was waiting for me to throw the ball again. Yeah, but that water is so cold, I said as I stopped to pick up the ball. It was only the middle of April and the water temperature probably wasn't even 50 degrees yet. Exposure, you know? If he fell in, he could die in like 20 minutes. Digger smiled. Exactly, he said calmly. We'd all be so lucky. And at that point, I threw the ball so hard it landed in the marsh near the water. Tilly took off after it like a shot and disappeared into the tall grass. Come on. I made eye contact with Digger when I said it again. Let's yell something. But we didn't. Digger dropped his eyes and backed off. And when he turned in profile, I glimpsed the hard lines of his scowl as he gazed out toward the red kayak. It was really the first time I realized how much anger Digger had packed inside. I knew he was sore because the D'Angelo's bought his grandfather's farm, tore down the old house, and built a mansion up there on the bluff. But up until then, maybe I hadn't realized how much it bothered him. Of course, it didn't help that we'd all been booted off the property a few days ago. But if you ask me, Mr. D'Angelo was pretty nice about it. He didn't yell or offend us, or anything like that. He merely asked us to leave because we were trespassing. And Digger did have that lit cigarette. I mean, Mr. D'Angelo had a right. For all he knew, we could have started a fire or something. But from Digger's point of view, we were only hanging out under our cliff, where we hung out a million times over the last 13 years. 
that cliff and all the property the D'Angelo's now own was all part of our stomping grounds. We shot tin cans out in the cornfield. We built forts in the woods, raced go-karts down the tractor roads. So you know, I did feel for some of Digger's frustration. What I don't understand is how Digger could have been so callous that morning when he said, if he's stupid enough to be out there, he can take what's coming. And how Digger and JT too could have been so blind to the awful possibilities, even after I reminded them that he could die in like 20 minutes. We ought to yell something. When exactly did they begin to feel shamed by it? Because it's always shamed me. And that's the end of chapter two. So to kind of recap that, they're out there playing on the property or near the property that uh, Digger's grandfather used to own. And Digger's very angry and and uh, the weather's bad and Mr. D'Angelo's out in that kayak and, and uh, Brady feels like he should have yelled something. So we'll have to see what happens as we move into chapter three.